भद्रम कर्णे शृणुयाम देवा भद्रम पश्ये मक्षभीजत्रा स्थिरंगुष्टुवागुम सस्तनु व्यशेम देवित यदायु स्वस्ति न इंद्रो वृद्धश्रवा स्वस्ति न पूषा विश्ववेदा स्वस्ति नाक्ष्यो अरिष्ट स्वस्ति नो बृहस्पतिर्दा ओ शाति 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 so we are studying the third chapter of the mandukya uh, karika the mandukya upanishad the first chapter which uh, which uh, was built around the mandukya upanishad it said that uh, two important points it made that brahman is non dual the ultimate reality is non dual and it also said that the world is an appearance these are these are the central teachings of advaita vedanta brahma satyam jagat mithya brahman uh, brahman is the reality and the world is an appearance now this non dual nature of the reality that non duality is ultimately real that's that's the ultimate reality and the appearance nature of the world that the world is is not real in itself can we understand this can we uh demonstrate this with the help of reasoning so that's why these two chapters come chapter 2 and chapter 3 chapter 2 takes up the question of the appearance nature of the world that the world is not a reality in itself jagat mithya that is shown in chapter 2 in fact the name of the chapter was vaitathya prakaranam which in sanskrit means vaitathya literally means not thus <coughs> the way we experience the world the truth is not exactly like that and that we have seen now in the third chapter the non duality of um, the absolute reality that there is only one one real one one reality in fact if you want to say advaita vedanta in one word the word advaita itself means non duality so can we understand non duality can we prove it with reason and experience because after all we experience a world of plurality not just duality plurality there are many many entities we are all different individual beings seem to be different from each other we are all different from each other there is a non living world a vast universe of millions and billions of entities and god if there is god it seems to be something different from us so this this very obviously pluralistic universe how can it be non dual that non dual means no second reality there is only one reality can we understand this demonstrate it with reason and experience that's the theme of the third chapter in fact the four great themes of this uh, text mandukya karika i mentioned it i think last time or last time before last the wonderful themes advaitam non duality अजातवाद नॉन ओरिजिनेशन ऑफ द यूनिवर्स अस्पर्श दैट द सो कॉल्ड रियालिटी एक्चुअली डज नॉट टच स्पर्श मीन्स टच डज नॉट इवन टच योर रियालिटी डज नॉट टच यू एक्चुअली अस्पर्श एंड अविरोध अविरोध देर इज नो कॉन्ट्राडिक्शन बिटवीन दिस टीचिंग एंड science religion all other kinds of religion science all in fact are harmonized by this teaching everything gets its place once you understand this teaching so these are very grand themes non duality non duality of what the reality brahman ajata non origination the universe did not even originate it did not was not even created uh the not only the universe even us as individual beings we did not actually become individual beings we are still that non dual reality so that is ajata and then asparsha this terrible samsara which we seem to be struggling with which we are seems to be enmeshed in this actually does not touch you at all and the last one is avirodha all the great uh, systems of um, you know thought 
whether scientific, materialistic or different religions, they seem to be in conflict with each other, religions with each other and religion on, as a whole against science. But they are all harmonized from this point of view. So these great four, four great themes, actually all of them are present in this third chapter. This third chapter is very beautiful. Um, so what have we uh, seen in this third chapter? So far what we have been seeing is this. The usual way the world is seen as God, world, individual, like a triangle. Individual means me, I. I am an individual. Here in front of me is a world, a universe. And I believe that there is some cause behind all of this. In religion that's called God. So this triangle, um, it has certain features. One is God is cause and these are effects. This we understand? It's produced by God somehow because in all religions God is the creator. Literally we are creatures and God is the creator in religions. And the universe is created by God. We are also created by God uh, in, in religion. So this is, so this is uh, ca um, causality is a feature of the, this. Uh, causality. Another feature is change. Change, obviously we are changing continuously, our minds are changing, our bodies are, um, they are born and they age and they are afflicted by disease and decay and death. And the world itself is changing so much. And even God, though God's essential nature in no religion, all religions, God is unchanging. But when God creates, God does something. So there must be some change involved somewhere. Um, in, in Vedanta, Saguna Brahman, Brahman with Maya. The Maya itself is changed into the universe. So there's a change. Maya changes. The God itself does not change. So change is there. And the third one, uh, third aspect is, this is duality. Causality, change and duality. Duality means there's difference. In this model, we are all different from each other. The world is different from us and within the world there are so many differences and God is different from all of this. So this is the normal model of um, a normal worldview, the ordinary worldview that most um, religions present to us and um, uh, science in a more materialistic way presents the same worldview to us. In, in place of God it will put some other cause. Now, what Mandukya is telling us is this is samsara. These are the characteristics of samsara. Samsara is, the, is, the, is our present situation. The trouble that we are caught in, the mess that we are caught in. Samsara is this. In Sanskrit, see normally when you use the word samsara, it really means this world of our life, you know, being born and uh, struggling in life and um, afflicted by suffering and death and um, hopelessness and meaninglessness. This entire situation we are caught in, the human condition is a, new, is a term we use these days, the human condition. Uh, here it's not only the human condition, the entire universe itself. This is samsara. In Sanskrit, these terms are karya karana, causality. God is karana, cause, and world is, and individual are karyam, effect. Change, vikari, savikaram. Subject to change and modification. You know, body, birth, growth, uh, maturity, decay, death. This is a change. So the body is sub subject to change. Mind is subject to change. The world is subject to change. In Sanskrit, savikara. And duality, dvaitam. A second, something apart from me exists independently. So entities are separate from each other. It's a fractured multiple reality, a pluralistic reality. This itself is called samsara. Karya karana. Karya karana, the, in the more familiar term is the, the law of karma, cause and effect. 
change and dvaita duality uh, savikara dvaita in contrast to this what uh, what mandukya is teaching us what advaita vedanta teaches and mandukya is teaching us is that the real self the real you the ultimate reality is none of them neither world nor individual nor god is the ultimate reality they are all appearances of one reality and that is you the real you and so didn't you just say that i am this one apparently i am this one really speaking that's what mandukya is teaching us you don't need mandukya for this this is our state of affairs mandukya investigates this and and points out there is an underlying reality the atman pure consciousness which has certain characteristics this is the ca- causality it is beyond causality beyond causality it is neither a cause nor an effect the atman is not produced like this nor is it a producer of this it is beyond change beyond change no change is there in the atman nirvikara and third it is not it is not dual it is non dual advaitam this is karya karana in sanskrit this is karya karana vilakshana atma in sanskrit this is savikara this is nirvikara atma this is dvaita this is advaita atma so this is samsara and this is moksha freedom moksha is freedom i have said a lot here you can think about it it's a whole textbook of vedanta is put here <laughs> this is our situation philosophically understood it is we are within cause we experience ourselves as being trapped in causality in a world of change and flux in fact this is the great theme theme of buddhism the second one anityam anityam sarvam anityam impermanent impermanent all is impermanent everything is in a flux not only impermanent but momentary kshanikam kshanikam sarvam kshanikam not only mom- impermanent and momentary but also empty void shunyam shunyam sarvam shunyam therefore dukham dukham sarvam dukham suffering suffering all is suffering all of that the buddha derives from the the changeful nature of reality as it is experienced and also notice that it is the world of duality separation not only duality separation difference and the all of it is samsara and moksha is just the opposite moksha is it has to be beyond causality it has to be beyond change and it has to be non dual and this non dual beyond change beyond causality is amazingly enough you the real you so to realize ourselves as that is the goal so this is the the teaching of advaita vedanta non dual vedanta if you want to put it in this way in the language of mandukya which we have been studying the same thing is stated in this way what we what i just said can you put it in the language of mandukya what is god world and individual in mandukya language god world and individual are experienced in three states waking dreaming and deep sleep in waking state what is god world and individual individual is called the waker you right now what you experience yourself to be a vishwa waker in sanskrit and the world is experienced as jagrat prapancha the world of the waking this physical universe outside us and god is the same consciousness in association with the entire universe in sanskrit called virat or vaishwanar or virat and the same thing god world and individual are experienced at a subtle level in our dreams so in our dreams i the individual i am called taijasa the dreamer and the world is a world manufactured in my mind it's not the physical world out there it's a world manufactured in my mind a subtle world of my dreams caused by my impressions my vasanas in the mind my dreams the subtle world swapna prapancha the world of of my dreams and in that case what would god be the cosmic mind hiranyagarbha consciousness associated with all our minds and again this god world and individual are experienced at a causal level at the deep sleep level at the deep sleep level 
I, when I'm in deep sleep, I am called Pragya in Sanskrit. And the world there, there is no separate world there. It's one uniform mass of not knowingness. Look back, look back. all of these, they, you must see it in your own experience. It's, don't take it as a theoretical framework. It's just a description of what we are experiencing. Are you with me? Is it not a description of what we are experiencing in deep sleep? It's a uniform mass of blankness where world and individual are blanked out. In fact, there is no experience there of causality, change or duality. So is that freedom? Deep sleep is freedom? No. Because the seeds of causality, change and duality are there. You come out of it. You come back into this world of change. Deep sleep state itself goes away, changes. And you are back into the world of duality. Exactly what was there earlier, before you fell asleep, that comes forth again. And God in the state of deep sleep, the, the corresponding idea of God would be, in fact, the causal idea of God, Ishwara. That's actually the idea of God in, in Vedanta. Um, consciousness associated with the potent potentiality of the entire universe. From which the entire universe, let's imagine the entire universe as a seed. Like a seed from which the banyan tree emerges. Imagine the entire universe reduced to a seed. Not a physical seed, just a potential from which the universe will emerge. That is uh, the conception of God in the deep sleep state. All of them are samsara. All of this is samsara. You can see very well then the usual idea of God in religion is also considered by Advaita to be a part of samsara. What is the idea of God in religion? A creator God. Omnipresent, omniscient, all-powerful, all good. Okay, fine. But still within samsara. Come, come. In contrast to this, in the Mandukya language, what is the Atman? The fourth, Turiyam. Right? And that one is, is beyond causality, is beyond change. It is non-dual, advaitam. Therefore, this turiyam is moksha. So this is what, this is the grand theme of the third chapter. Now, this turiyam, Gaudapada says, notice five, five aspects of this turiyam. Um, if you notice this about yourself, about your real self, you will, you will enjoy freedom, moksha. Five aspects. To explain these five aspects, we'll get into that. To explain these five aspects, Gaurapada introduces his famous, his grand example of the pot and space. So there is this great space, what he calls the Mahakasha. Once a pot is created, it seems to enclose, cut off, demarcate a part of this great space and we call it the pot space, the space inside the pot. Just keep this example in mind. He uses two grand examples. One example was in the second chapter. Do you remember what it was? Dream. Yes, dream example. Be confident. You remember it, but you're not confident. <laughs> like, you know, in India especially, when teacher, teacher asks a question, these children will think, what does the teacher want to know? <laughs> <laughs> so, now the dream example. To prove the falsity of the world, to demonstrate the falsity of the world, the dream example is a powerful example. And to demonstrate the oneness of the individual with the absolute, that you are that absolute. This pot and space example is very powerful. So what is the pot and space example? Notice something about the pot and space example. The space is actually not at all affected by the creation of the pot, but seems to be affected. It seems to be very powerful illusion is created that a part of space has been cut off. You'll think that hasn't it? That's what I thought till now. No, it, it hasn't. We discussed this last time. So notice five things about this. About what? Part, great space, and part space. I'm translating the Sanskrit. Mahakasha, Akasha means space. Mahakasha, great space. Um, part is ghata, ghata. And the space within the pot, pot space is ghata akasha. So ghata akasha, ghata mahakasha, these are the three terms. Notice few things. First of all, contrary to appearances, the pot space is not born out of the mahakasha. It is not created out of the mahakasha, only seems to be. When the space was there, when we made this building, 
then uh, the chapel space, uh, the, the prayer hall space, the room space, the washroom space, the kitchen space, have they been created? They seem to have been, but that's not true. We have just put up the limits and boundaries and then we call this one and that one. They have not been created. They existed earlier. And they exist exactly like that. Nothing has been done to the space at all. You cannot do anything to the space. You just put up boundaries and walls and call it this, uh, this is 34 west and that is 35 west and so on. But it's exactly the same space. So the part space is not born of the uh, great space. It is not different. It's the same space, undivided. Nothing has been done. Therefore, part space is not born, though it seems to be born with the creation of the spot, of the pot. Similarly, the individual being is actually not born from the Atman, but because of the body-mind, it seems to be a, become an individual. That pure consciousness, the Turiyam, seems to have become a Jivatma, individual sentient being. I'll keep using the term Jivatma. What is Jivatma? Individual sentient being. Who is this guy? Us. <laughs> What you feel yourself to be right now, you are the Jivatma. Jivatma is not born of the Absolute. It's a powerful illusion created by the presence of the body. Just as the space in the pot has not been cut off by the presence of the pot, not that consciousness has been cut off or demarcated by the appearance of the body. Rather, the body and mind have appeared in consciousness. The body-mind complex functions like the pot. And space is like pure consciousness. So individual beings consciousness and the absolute consciousness are exactly one and the same, undisturbed, even when the body and mind have arisen, yet it seems to have become an individual. Number one. Number two, the second feature, notice that in, upon the death, upon the breaking of the pot, it seems that the part space merges with the great space. The pot space was cut off so, so long and now when the pot is broken, the pot space merges with the great space. It could be true that if you have a pot of water and you immerse it in the, in the river and then break the pot, it is true to say that the water in the pot merged with the water of the river. That is true. Because the water in the pot was actually cut off from the water in the river. But not so for space. Space was never cut off. When you break the pot, it's just that the pot is no longer there. Not that the space inside the pot now becomes one with the great space. Similarly, with the destruction of the body, it's not that the individual becomes one with the absolute. The individual was always one with the absolute. In fact, the individual was never born. This is the great doctrine of Ajata, the non-origination of the individual consciousness. Um, it, the individual beings, Jivatma, does not merge with Brahman or Turiyam upon the death of the body. Does not. So, oh, it remains separate then. It never was separate. It always was one. There is an illusion of separation created by the body-mind. When the body dies, it is still the same. Still the same. Third, another feature, notice. The contents of the pot... One pot has dirt in it, another pot may be stored, there's some smoke in it maybe, another pot has some nasty fluid in it or something like that, another pot has the holy Ganges water in it. Now, it creates an illusion that this is an impure pot, the space is impure, that space is pure because it stores the holy water from the river Ganges, these are classic examples. But actually nothing is done to the space. The space within the pot is not soiled, is not made impure, by the contents of the pot. Nor is it made purer or improved in any way by the contents of the pot. What is affected by the contents of the pot? Maybe the air inside the pot is affected. Maybe the pot itself is affected. But not the space. Similarly, pure consciousness, even when associated with the body and mind, the characteristics of the body and mind, by here specifically they mean papa punya, the sin or the merits, the goodness, the, the, the purity or the impurity of the person, the things that I have done, my good karma and bad karma. The, the, um, so that does not affect the consciousness. You, the consciousness, you are always perfect. You are, at, at that fundamental level, you are always perfect. 
our karma, our purity and impurity, our good and evil, they do affect the body and the mind, but they do not affect you, the pure consciousness. This is another great thing. Third, fourth, notice another thing. The characteristics of the pot are not the characteristics of the space. Round pot, space is round. We even say that is a round space, a circular space, a, 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 a conical space. No, the space is not round or circular or conical. It's the container which is round or uh, circular or conical, right? Similarly, the characteristics of our body-mind do not affect you, the consciousness. You are not affected. The Jivatma, the real nature of Jivatma, which is Turiyam, is not affected by characteristics of body-mind. Man, woman, I am a man. It's affected. I am affected by it. No. Contrary to our great themes of the great quarrels of the, the gender wars we are going through and all of that, which has its own place. Which has its own place in society. But remember, fundamentally we are the same and absolutely perfect. Not affected by the ups and downs of the body, by the characteristics of the body, race, gender, man, woman, animal, plant, whatever you call it. Or mythical terms, they'll talk about the bodies of the gods in the heavens, more perfect. Bodies of demons in hell, horrible. And um, human bodies, animal bodies, whatever we have, not if you are not affected by it. Body is affected by it, no doubt. Even by the mind, no matter how saintly, how purified, or how twisted and perverted and evil or dull or lazy or retarded, whatever you call it, that's the mind. You are not affected by it. Just like the space is not affected by the contents. Remember, mind is affected by the content, by the characteristics of the mind. The body is affected by the characteristics of the body. You are not affected by it. You are affected by it to the extent that you own this body-mind as I. To that extent you are affected. That is samsara. Fifth. Each of them is worth meditating upon and dwelling upon for a long time. As you dwell upon this, it clarifies what you are and what you are not. And it frees you. Ultimately, enlightenment will free, break all bondages, break all ignorance and set you free. Moksha, or Nirvana, whatever you call it. But even before that, in fact, Shankara in one place says the one of the... What, what, what this does, what Vedanta does, it derives the meaning of Vedanta in another Upanishad, commentary on the uh, Kata Upanishad, I think. There, he says, it does three things. It destroys ignorance and sets you free from samsara. So that's, we, we know that, that's the purpose of Vedanta. Second, it, it takes the limited soul, the Jivatma, the individual sentient being, to the Absolute, the infinite. And remember, takes is not in a physical sense. It does not take you on a journey, physical journey. It just reveals to you your real nature. That's the second thing it does. And third thing it does is very interesting. He says, even before all of this, during this process of study and meditation and all, it loosens the bonds of samsara, shitili karana. It reduces your suffering within samsara. Even before it gives your final result. The bonds of samsara which are so tight, we are caught in what is called the human condition. It loosens those bonds. It gives you a foretaste of freedom. Of, of, of uh, freedom, of joy, of peace, of serenity. Okay. What more remains? The fifth aspect. The fifth aspect is relationship. It seems that the space within the pot has a relationship with the great space. What? What is the relationship? Some say the spot space is produced by the great space. No. There is no difference between the pot space and the great space. Some say the pot space is a part of the great space. It seems like that. There is a great space and you divide it up into so many rooms. So each room, the space is a part of the great... No. Because why, why will you not say this room is a part of the space of the entire building? It clearly... You see the rooms are parts of the building. The space in this room is not a part of the space of the, of the whole building. Rather, 
It is one undivided space. It only seems to be parts. It's difficult to grasp because the illusion is so powerful. We are not parts of the divine. We are not parts of the absolute. You and the absolute are absolutely the same. If you say part of the absolute, it becomes Vishishtadvaita. Yeah, Vishishtadvaita. The qualified monism of Ramanuja. If you say the part space is a product of the great space, it becomes Dvaita, the theistic religions. But non-dualism says that it's not a part or a whole relationship. It's not a produced, creator-created relationship. You are exactly the one with the absolute. You are the absolute. It's an identity relationship. If you want to say relationship at all, so similarly, consciousness, individual consciousness is not a product of the absolute. It is not a part of the absolute. Rather, it is the absolute. So five aspects of what? Of yourself. What meditating upon? This is what is being discussed now. That you are not born, the individual is not born, nor destroyed, nor does it merge with the absolute. Nor is it affected by the impurities and the problems of the body-mind complex. Nor is it, uh, does it have specific characteristics of the body-mind complex. Good or bad, whatever they might be. Nor does it have any relationship with the Absolute. Because it is, it is the Absolute. Alright, I have told you what we are going to study today. <laughs> Let's uh, just go ahead and do that. We were on verse 3. Is that true? We have done three. Yeah, we have done three. So, three was, in verse three, Gaudapada introduced the example of space and pot. And said, just like the pot space is actually not born of uh, the great space, similarly, the individual, the Jivatma is actually not born, nothing is created from uh, the absolute, pure consciousness. Pure consciousness remains as pure consciousness, but the illusion of individuality is born. Illusion of a pot space is born because of the pot. Illusion of individuality and separation, it's born because of body-mind. Body-mind, we'll talk about that later, because a question might come. Intelligent student will ask, ah, all right, so individual being is not born from the pure consciousness, but bodies and minds are there. So bodies and minds are born of pure consciousness? That we will see later. Let's just do these five aspects of, of um, where he uses this pot space example. Four. So third one says that birth is an illusion. You are not actually born, you are not created in any way. Fourth. Death. That you are merging upon the destruction of the body, you somehow merge. Or at realization, or when you become enlightened, you merge into the absolute. Yesterday somebody asked in the class, so it is like, you know, like gradually we become one with the divine. He says, he used a nice example, like you download something from the, uh, so, so you have a bar which shows how much you've downloaded, how much of the divine we are downloading into ourselves. Is it like that? No. Does the space in the pot gradually, little by little, 80% space common with the world, 90% and then now 100% uh, merged with the external space? Nothing like that. It only seems to be like that. You are the absolute, at death, at enlightenment, at whatever, you don't merge with the uh, absolute. You realize yourself as the absolute, at, not at death, at enlightenment. At death what happens? Just like the pot is broken, the body dies, that's all. Number four. Ghata dishu pralineshu, Ghata dishu pralineshu, Ghata kasha dayo yatha, Ghata kasha dayo yatha, Akashe sampraliyante, Akashe sampraliyante, Tadvad jiva ihatmani, Tadvad jiva ihatmani. So just as the space confined within the jars, actually not confined within the jars, seems to be confined within the jars becomes one with the great space outside when the jar is broken. Becomes one with means what? It's, it is one with the great space outside. And nothing actually happens to that space. What happens is the jar is broken. That's all. The pot is broken. Similarly, Jivatma, the individual, 
it seems to merge with the absolute um, upon the death of the body or upon enlightenment or whatever. But it's just you are the absolute. In fact, in enlightenment, all that happens is you realize that I am that. I was that. I am that. I always will continue to be that. In fact, what is enlightenment? It is the removal of the error that I am not Brahman. The removal of the error, the error that I am not the absolute. That error is deeply set within us. We don't even know what is the absolute, what is pure consciousness. And when we know about it, the first thing we come to the conclusion is, I am not that. <laughs> Whatever I am, I am not that. Advaita is a process of educating us into seeing our real nature you are that. You always wear that. You are that. And you continue to be that. It's perfectly alright. That's what you realize. And that is freedom. Akashe sampraliyante. Space within the pot and space outside, they seem to become one. Similarly, consciousness of the individual seems to be one with the, uh, with, uh, with the absolute. It seems to be. It, it is the absolute. Number five. In fact, at death, you know what happens, according to Vedanta? The physical body dies at the end of its allotted karma, and the subtle body, sukshma sharira, the subtle body, which is our mind, intellect, our memories, our individuality, the person, that transmigrates. Not only according to Advaita, but according to all um, Hindu, Buddhist, Jain ideas, that it goes on to other births, other lives, other worlds, which are called different heavens and then comes back into this world of action and uh, takes a new birth. New birth means becomes associated with a new body. So the life of the individual continues. What Advaita Vedanta says is that all of this, this body and new bodies to come, the death of this body, the birth of new bodies, they are all appearances in that one consciousness which you are, which is not at all affected by the births, the appearance of the birth and death of bodies. This is not, at least here a real pot is created and there seems to be a space in the pot. In Advaita even body is not really born. From the point of view of consciousness, there are appearances and disappearances of bodies. A lot like, if, if that you find that mysterious and difficult to believe, you do it every night. When you dream, in your mind so many bodies appear. And among them is your own body. It appears in your dream and you are fully associated with that body. You become an individual being in that dream, a jivatma. You remain absolutely safe. You are safe and sound sleeping on your bed. And you go through so many experiences. Those are appearances. You are not affected by that. Nor has indeed any body really been born there. It's, all, it's also a projection of your own mind. So the birth of the body and your associated individuality within it and the drama of the dream, the whole thing happens in the dreamer's mind. And this is an example. This we all agree, it's true. That's what happens. This uh, Advaita Vedanta is saying that this is what is happening now in the waking state also. There, mind projects a dream. Here, in consciousness, this universe is projected. Question. Yes. The causal body and the sukshma sharira, they travel together. Yes. The causal body is nothing other than the potential form of the subtle body. Again, remember, gross body, subtle body, causal body. They are not matters of speculation. Gross body or physical body is this one. Not theory, a fact. Causal body is when you look inside. Thoughts, feelings, emotions, your distinct personality. Your personal identity. That's, that's what is, the, is a subtle body. Beyond that, if you push further, you will find a blankness. You experience it in deep sleep. You experience it in deep meditation. Absolute quietness of the mind. When you are not aware of the external world, you are not thinking inside, you are not dreaming, planning, remembering, uh, desiring, hating. None of that. Yet you are awake. So that is the causal body. The, the potential state of the subtle body. So this one travels, actually goes to other worlds, to other bodies. That's the idea. You might say that remains to be proved. Advaita Vedanta couldn't care less because from the point of view of Advaita Vedanta, even that is an appearance. You can treat it as a dream. Then the next feature, 
very important for us all those things we we um, impose superimpose upon ourselves and suffered from i am guilty i am unhappy i am bad i am suffering i am unfortunate or i am i am fortunate who is there like me i am the best of all and um, uh, all the others are losers compared to me arrogance and all of these are appearances in bo- in the body mind complex the pure consciousness beyond it which you are is not affected by any of this no more than a screen is affected by the movie you play and it could be a comedy it could be a a horror movie it could be a tragedy the screen does not cry or laugh or uh, nothing happens to the screen in fact even a better example is the audience which watches those movies and the audience laughs and cries and enjoys it and yet it's not affected they do not undergo the same uh, tragedies and sufferings as that one all right exactly like that the contents of the pot affect the pot but they don't affect space similarly the contents of body mind do not affect consciousness you fifth yathai kasmin ghata kaashe yathai ghata kaashe rajo dhuma dibhir yute rajo dhuma dibhir yute न सर्वे संप्रयुज्यन्ते सर्वे संप्रयुज्यन्ते तद्वज्जीवा सुखादिभि तद्वज्जीवा सुखादिभि जस्ट एज द कंटेंट्स ऑफ ऑफ द स्मोक और डर्ट रजो मींस डर्ट धूमा मींस स्मोक इन वन पॉट व्हाई शुड देयर बी स्मोक इन अ पॉट If you knew in, in India, you would see it. It's very common. Uh, one, we are fighting mosquitoes. I know we used to do it in the monastery. Uh, I don't know what is the what is the content. Dhuni, yes, but English. No, dhup sticks is. But what what is the thing that that dhuna? They they put it dhuni. They put it there. It's like camphor and something else, and it smells very nice, and it produces masses of smoke, and uh, uh, it. we like it the mosquitoes don't like it so it's a good way of driving away mosquitoes it's a very in the <laughs> so in the monastery we used to do this uh, uh, in the evenings so the, it was the duty of the novices by turn we had to go to different rooms the temple and there would be a pot with that thing burning inside it slowly and so the uh, fragrant smoke would be produced and we would wave it around everything is done as a, like a religious ritual there so we would wave it to the different pictures the idea would be to fill the room with smoke but we'd wave it to the holy pictures or something like that so there's smoke in the pot there's smoke in the pot and some of the novices were naughty so you know we had to hand over this duty to the next person we had a schedule so we do it for 3 days or a week and the next somebody else and you have to train up that first you do it in this room and then you go to the next room then you go to the shrine and then you go to this place and the hall and everywhere and how much smoke to give so uh there was one i know of one of my brother monks who was who was very creative and mischievous also i think the two go through together sometimes <laughs> so the, when he trained up his successor he said okay here is the picture of uh, swami vivekananda three times clockwise and three times counter clockwise <laughs> and here is the picture of the divine mother uh, three times like this and with a little dance <laughs> and that person swallowed it just so maybe that's so who knows <laughs> and so he was doing this ridiculous thing <laughs> and everybody was in split <laughs> so maybe it's, it's that's the way it is to be done who knows <laughs> after all it's an old monastery <laughs> and there was this old monk he passed away a few years ago a wonderful old swami he was our sanskrit grammar teacher not ours because by the time we came as students he was too old to teach but he was still there so we had to put the smoke in his room also um and he was very particular about everything for example uh he couldn't bear loud so- sounds so he had this old you know the alarm clocks the old alarm clocks so his alarm clock was there but it had it had a clear ticking sound so it had to be put in a jar with a lid to fasten so the air the sound doesn't come out <laughs> things like that uh, and 
so the one who had to go and put smoke in his room in the evenings it was a difficult job because the old monk swami would go out of the room stand in the window outside and the thing was you would have to put so much smoke so that he couldn't see the switchboard of the you know where the fans and the lights the switchboard he wouldn't be able to see it from the window until he he still sees it he says please go on go on <laughs> ah that's enough now <laughs> so some parts have smoke some have dust in them some have milk in them some have something else the space within the pot is not affected by by the contents it's exact is always the pure consciousness you are not affected by the papa punya the sin and the merit the goodness and the defects of the body mind complex do you suffer oh i am overweight i am skinny that's the body how can consciousness be over, overweight or skinny have you ever heard of a skinny consciousness or an overweight consciousness no i i am uh, unhappy that's the mind the same mind which is unhappy in, throughout one day how many times happy how many times unhappy you wake up happy and curious then you, for a moment you become irritated sometimes you may go into an uh, into a into a rage then you are bored then you are happy again for a while the mind changes continuously behind that it is the same consciousness you see one swami the way they teach is this says are you happy or unhappy and the answer of the student was um i'm both both happy and unhappy then no oh, the first answer was i'm happy are you always happy no sometimes unhappy so which one are you happy or unhappy and both sometimes happy sometimes unhappy not at the same time sometimes happy sometimes unhappy and then the swami says wah kabhi gadha kabhi kabhi gaye sometimes you are a donkey sometimes you are a cow and then the student says ah i see what you mean no 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 what i meant was sometimes i feel happy sometimes i feel unhappy okay so happiness and unhappiness are feelings they are not clearly stuck with you they are not velcroed on you right they come and go therefore you the one who feels happy or unhappy you in yourself you are neither happy nor unhappy is that true or not you must first understand it as a matter of reason and then look into yourself psychologically and see yeah it's true if these things come and go none of them really belong to me they shine in my light in me the consciousness in me the awareness a feeling of happiness arises in the mind a feeling of dissatisfaction arises in the mind and goes away also i the consciousness am i satisfied or unsatisfied am i happy or unhappy none of them unaffected so this is what he wants to say now one big point look at the translation he says just as all the spaces confined within the various jars are not darkened when one of the spaces becomes contaminated by dust smoke etc so also is the case with all the individuals in the matter of being affected by happiness etc one point is there that you the consciousness are not affected at all for one another point has been raised and answered here we have to appreciate this one great objection against non duality is this it may not occur to us but the other philosophers they were fiercely against this kind of uh, philosophy why they say it will lead to disaster why if you say we are one consciousness like one space appearing as many because of many parts we are one consciousness appearing as many because of many bodies and minds we are all one self one atma one self in that case it will lead to great confusion when one is happy everyone should be happy when one is uh, sad everyone should be sad when one is uh, born all are born or when one dies all and if one gets enlightenment everyone should get enlightenment that would be a good result but doesn't happen if we are one self questions like i if you are all one consciousness just a minute i know the contents of this mind how come i don't know the contents of your minds if you are all one consciousness so these questions arise so uh, this is like the it will lead to chaos it it never really happens this way so clearly we are all different beings that's the objection given by whom the sankhya philosophers the nyaya the various dualistic philosophers in india at that time they said it it does not work it's not true we are all different consciousness 
and this objection is answered here. It says that, uh, see, what you are seeing as different beings and the, the experiences of different beings, those are contents of the pots. Uh -huh. The minds and the bodies, they are different. The pots are affected by the content. If you keep smoke in the pot for a long time, it will smell smoky. If you keep milk in the pot for a long time, it will get, it will absorb some of the milk. Similarly, the bodies and minds, they are affected by their particular contents. But the contents of the body mind of one person do not affect the contents uh, of the body mind of another person. They are different. Consciousness equally shines upon all of them. So, when you say, if one is happy, others should also become happy? No, that does not mean that. If one part is smoky, will all parts become smoky? No. If one part has um, Ganga water in it, will all parts get Ganga water in them? Of course not, that's ridiculous. Similarly, one, one mind has a feeling of happiness. Their consciousness illumines that feeling of happiness. And that particular individual consciousness limited by the mind will feel, I am happy. But that does not mean others around will, will feel happy. Consciousness can continue to be the same in all bodies and minds. Birth and death. Why should the birth of one be the birth of all? The birth of one is the birth is like creation of one part. When one part is created, it's not that all parts are created. When one part is broken, it's not that all parts are broken. Similarly, when one is born or one dies, it's not equal to the birth and death of other beings. So consciousness can continue to be one and unaffected. The differences are in the body mind. The differences are not in consciousness. It will not lead to chaos as uh, the Sankhya philosophers, especially the Sankhya philosophers object to this. Enlightenment. Who gets enlightened? Does Turiyam get enlightened or the individual being get enlightened? Enlightenment is in the individual being. What is enlightenment? I just said the removal of the error that I am not the absolute. This one thinks I am not the absolute. I am this individual. This error is removed and it knows I am the absolute. The error was there and it was removed there. So each individual, so my guru's enlightenment is not my enlightenment, unfortunately. So both good and bad is the same thing. If one be becomes a saint, if everybody became a saint, that would be nice. But it doesn't work that way. But one becomes a sinner, everybody doesn't become a sinner also. One consciousness that remains unperturbed, unaffected by the changes of body-mind. And the changes of one body and mind do not mean that all others also will have the same, even if they have the same self, same consciousness. That's what uh, Advaita says. So there's a this is an answer to a very important charge leveled by the dualists against the non-dualists. The, dual, the charge is that it will lead to incoherence when you talk about one self. We are clearly different selves. The answer is no. We are clearly different bodies and minds. But consciousness is not different. How, will you differentiate, how do you differentiate bodies? Clearly I can see different bodies. How do you differentiate minds? Clearly minds are different because when you talk about your experiences and I talk about mine and she talks about hers, different. Your knowledge, my knowledge, his or her knowledge, different. Your memories, my memories, different. So memory, the mind, the personality, this different. Body, different, clearly. But if you subtract body mind, the pure consciousness, contentless consciousness, how will you differentiate? How is it different from person to person? Not different. Yeah. So that one is non-dual and not, not different. That's what it means here. There is something deeper involved here. Gaurapada is slightly <laughs> mischievous. He will point out later. He says, oh dualist, you think this one is happy, that one is unhappy. And if I say both are the same self, how can it be possible? Everyone will become either happy or unhappy. But the fact is, when you say this one is happy, this one is unhappy, even that one is also not unhappy. The consciousness in this one and that one, they are not affected by the contents of that body-mind. This self and that self, none of them are either sinful or uh, unhappy or affected by death or disease. No, the bodies and minds are affected. So even in a particular individual being, the consciousness there is not affected. Let alone all the consciousness in all beings being affected by that. Do you see the point? He has not mentioned it here. 
what he has done here is a temporary adjustment. He says just as smoke in one pot does not mean that all the pots will be smoky. Similarly, unhappiness or impurity in one mind does not mean that all minds will become impure. And that answers your objection against oneself. But one step further, even in that body, body which is racked by disease and old age, mind which may, may be full of unhappiness or misery, even there the self is not affected by this. That is the great, great teaching. He'll come to that later on. He says it is actually childish to think that even in one body and mind the self is affected by this. No, it is not. Number six. So there is a long commentary by Shankaracharya where he answers this, the attacks of the dualists who say that non-dualism leads to incoherence. The next feature, tall part space becomes tall, round part space becomes round, no, no, no. The part is tall or round or square but not the space. Similarly, man, woman, learned, uh, uneducated. <coughs> Rich, poor, these are circumstances in the world, circumstances of the body, circumstances of the mind. They do not affect the, um, the consciousness behind. That is being said. What was the earlier one? The two seem to be similar. The earlier one was the problems. He says, doshaha, impurities, sufferings do not affect consciousness. This one is... The specific qualities, the differences between us, man, woman, good, bad, uh, rich, poor, uh, learned, uh, whatever, saint, sinner, whatever, they do not affect the consciousness. The differences are not the differences of consciousness. Rupa Kadya Samakhyascha Rupa Kadya Samakhyascha Bhidyante Tatra Tatra Vai Vidyante tatra tatra vai Akashasya na bhedosti Akashasya na bhedosti Tadvadji veshu nirnayaham Tadvadji veshu nirnayaham Though forms, actions and names differ in respect of the differences in the spaces created by jars etc. Yet there is no multiplicity in space. So also in the definite conclusion with regard to individual beings. See, if you read it like that, it doesn't seem to make much sense. What did he say just now? It, what it means is, all the differences among us are created by three things. Nama, Rupa, Karma. Forms, man, woman, uh, plant, animal, living being, non-living being. These are forms. Uh, the size, shape, the characteristics, the species, so on and so forth. And then names, the labels we apply. That also creates difference. And the actions, karma, which we do. The karma, the moment you do karma, you are caught in the law of karma, causality. You do something, it generates a result. It, what you do is dharma, good, consciously done good action. It generates what is called punya, merit. And the result will be in some time, in this life or the next it will give sukha, happiness. If I consciously do something I know to be bad, that is called adharma. And it generates demerit. Demerit means papa, what you call sin or demerit. And the result of that will be dukkha, some kind of unhappiness in this life or the next. So this is karma. And that differentiates, that in fact explains the wide differences among us, all the jivatmas. If you are the same consciousness, why is it so different? Um, why are we so different? We are different because of we are caught in causality. The chain of cause and effect behind me is another chain of cause and effect behind you and behind each of us. We have an ancient chain of cause and effect. What we are seeing is the product of a long series of uh, causes and effects stretching back to beginningless time. So we have created ourselves. It's not fatalistic. Those causes, causes have been set in motion by ourselves. So we are the result of what we have set in motion in forgotten pasts. Now, um, so these co have caused the differences among us. Name, form and karma. That is what is called in Sanskrit here. Nama, no, Rupa Karya Samakhya. Samakhya means name, the names. 
Karya means karma and rupa means form. Form, name and action. Vidyante tatra tatra vai. This is what differentiates in each case. So the name, form and function of the parts, they are different. This is a jar, this is a little pot, this is a water pot, this is a pot, smoke pot and so on. This is round, that is uh, square, that is conical and so on and so forth. And the work of one is to store water, the other one is to store smoke uh, or to generate smoke, the other one is to keep rice, whatever. So name, form and action are different. But that does not mean the space in each of them is dif different. It's exactly the same and it's not affected by the name. Not affected by the form of the pot, not affected by the function of the pot. Similarly, bodies and minds are different. They have different names, forms and actions behind them. But consciousness, you are not differentiated by that. Though the different, illusion of difference is very powerful. It seems to be different. Akashasya nabhedosti. There is no difference in the space within these various parts of different shape, name and function. Similarly, there is no difference in consciousness. You are one and the same consciousness. The, the body's minds may be different names, forms and uh, karma. Tadva jive shunirnaya. This is the conclusion about the jivatma, the sentient beings. Just like that. It's clear? Then the next one. So this one says that we do not have differences in features, specific features. The the features belong to body mind, not to you, the consciousness. Then the next, the fifth um, feature to meditate upon in this space and part example is that the relationship between part space and great space. What is the relationship between the space enclosed in a part and the great space? They are one and the same. There is no relationship. Is the small space a product of the great space? No. Is the small space a part of the great It seems to be. Is it a part of the great space? No. It just seems to be because of the parts. Similarly, there is no relationship or the only relationship between individual and the absolute is identity. This one is in error, it's an individual. In knowledge, it realizes itself as the absolute. Unenlightened, I am a poor suffering human being. Enlightened, I am none other than the absolute consciousness. When? Right now. Always was, always will be. Seven. That's what's going to talk about now. Nakashasya ghata kasho. Nakashasya ghata kasho. Vikara vaya vauyatha. Vikara vaya vauyatha. Naivatmana sada jivo. Naivatmano sada jivo. Vikara vaya votatham, Vikara vaya votatham. Just as the space within a jar is not a transformation, not a product of the space, the great space, so an individual being is never a transformation or a part of the Supreme Self. So just as the space within a part is not a product, is not transformed from the great space, Similarly, the individual is actually not produced by that. Why not? Because the absolute is beyond causality. It's not a cause nor an effect. Second, it's not a part. Because the absolute is one and indivisible, non-dual. What is a part? When something, something is made of parts, then it's dualistic. But it's non-dual. There's no second thing. So the individual cannot be a part of that uh, absolute. Then what's, what, what is the individual? It is the absolute. If you say what relationship, the only relationship you can think of is not even a unity. Unity is two things becoming one. It is identity, virtually the same thing. A is A. Nakasha ghata kasho vikara vayavu yatha. Just as the pot space is not a modification of the great space, nor is it a part of the great space. Similarly, the jiva, this individual sentient being, is not a product, a transformation of the Atman, nor is it a part of the Atman. <coughs> what is it then? It is the Atman. Now, Gaurapada adds a little footnote. Remember, the, in the fifth verse, he had said, 
just as the smokiness of one pot does not mean all pots become smoky, just as the dirt in one pot does not mean all pots become dirty, similarly the, the characteristics of one body mind, the, the impurities of one mind uh, will not affect other minds, even though the self is one. That's what he said. But the truth is, the impurities of one mind do not affect the self there itself. That, that's what he's going to say now, eighth one. So this one you should relate it to the fifth uh, verse. Not fifth verse. Fifth verse? Yes, fifth verse. Eighth verse you should relate with the fifth verse. In legal language they say read with. This document read with that document. So read with the fifth verse. Yatha bhavati balanam Yatha bhavati balanam Gaganam malinam malaihi, Gaganam malinam malaihi, Tatha bhavatya buddhanam, Tatha bhavatya buddhanam, Atma pi malino malaihi, Atma pi malino malaihi. Just as the sky seems to be, it says becomes blackened, not becomes, seems blackened by dust. Sandstorm or something, the sky has become red or stormy or cloud. Um, you know, children think that the sky has become dirty. It's so gray or black clouds are there, sky has become dirty. To the ignorant, ign balanam here means children. For, for the ignorant, for children, they think it has, the sky has become affected by the smoke or the dust. You say that, of course it has, it's pollution, smog. Yes, but pollution of what? Not pollution of space. It's pollution of the atmosphere. Yes, the air has become polluted. That you can say. Water can become polluted. Earth can become polluted. But not space. Space has, has absolutely not affected. So, uh, just as children think, Gaganam Malinam, the sky has become dirty because of the presence of smoke or clouds or dirt or, or, or dust. Similarly, though it has not, Similarly, tatha bhavati abuddhanam. Buddha, the enlightened. Abuddha, not enlightened. For the unenlightened, atma bhavati malino malehi. The, the self has become impure. I am a bad person. I am a loser. You, you, you do not know how people suffer. from. It is not just a lack of self-esteem. They are continuously blaming themselves, continuously victimizing themselves. I am bad. I am horrible. I am, um, I am worthless. No, you are the absolute in which, the wor in, in which words are born and appear and disappear. Your grandeur, you, do not, you have no idea of that. So, I am, uh, I am affected by this, by the contents of my mind. See, some practical thing. Don't be too affected by the mind. Mature person. It's like little children. Little children will sometimes cry. It's not very serious. So the mind will sometimes get upset. It's a delicate instrument. It will sometimes get upset, sometimes get irritated, sometimes it will be obstinate, sometimes it will be demanding, sometimes bored, mostly unsatisfied. Don't pay it any heed. It's just like a toddler. When the mind is delighted and enthusiastic, don't pay it any heed. Just like a toddler. It's cute. And when the mind is unhappy and complaining and irritated, don't pay it any heed. It's not you. A mature person will not give um, importance to the fluctuations of the mind. And an amazing thing is when you stop giving importance to the fluctuations of the mind, again like a toddler, uh, if you ignore its, uh, uh, its vagaries, it tends to calm down. Similarly, the mind also tends to calm down. It's we who have coddled the mind or tortured the mind. That's why the mind becomes so perverted and perverse. Let it be. Let it be. You hold on to what you're going to do and let the mind be. You will find the mind calms down. It's a practical thing. It has nothing to do with high spirituality. But this much separation, this much gap you must develop between yourself and the mind. Now that we know we are not the mind, never were. Therefore, we need not embrace the mind so tightly. So, hmm. 
some people also, maybe genetics or whatever, or some scars in the past, they have a tendency to be depressed. Tendency to be unhappy. Some are sunny by disposition. It's not that they are particularly spiritual. Just that they are happy. Some are dour and, and sour by disposition. Not that they are unspiritual. It's just the mind is like that. <laughs> and there's modern, there are discoveries in modern positive psychology which go to prove this. That we have, because of, they, they will probably say because of our genetic uh, markers, we have different set points of satisfaction and dissatisfaction. So a person may be generally bubbly and happy. Um, it has something to do with the genetics of that particular brain and the samskaras of that mind. Doesn't matter. Some person tends to be over serious and uh, not particularly, you know, hardly ever cracks a smile. I knew a monk, he has passed away now, I can say. <laughs> so, his expression was always. <laughs> and one senior monk said, said that, that Swami, he said, <laughs> that Swami, he has a permanent thundercloud expression. <laughs> but he's a monk. And was he unhappy? Not particularly. I knew him, I met him a few times closely. He's just like everybody else. He just was not the, the <laughs> laughing kind. In fact, our president, 11th president, Swami Gambhiranand, his name, Gambhira means serious. <laughs> no. Brahman, the absolute, another name for the absolute is Gambhira. Literally, it means very deep, very utterly profound, Gambhira. His name was Gambhirananda, one who takes delight in the utterly profound. But the utterly profound part was prominent and the delight part was not very prominent <laughs> in him. So... Um, there's a story of when there was a group photograph taken with the Swami, with other monks and the Gambhiranandji. And the photographer kept on entreating him, Swami, smile. After a couple of times, the Swami said, don't you know, I'm Gambhira in name and in action. <laughs> See, he had a, Gambhira means I'm serious. No, not only in name, but in, in life too. <laughs> so he had, a, he had a slight sense of, you know, he had a very subtle sense of humor. He, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't show it, but it was there. <coughs> I think this book is oh, this is translated by Swami Gambhirananda, yes. <laughs> yeah. He, he has a huge, um, his contribution is enormous. If you want to study Vedanta with the help of English books, then I would recommend this. Swami Nikhilananda's books are more popular, uh, but they were written for an English-knowing Western audience. But they are, uh, they are not precise translations of Shankara's commentaries or the original texts. They are more like a running free translation. You get the gist of it. But if you want to go deep, if you want to know exactly what the original uh, teachers have written, then you need these books. Eight Upanishads by Swami Gambhirananda with Shankara's commentary. Literal, word by word, I mean sentence by sentence translation. Bhagavad Gita with Shankara's commentary, Swami Gambhirananda. And Masterpiece. The Brahma Sutra Bhashya, the commentary on the Brahma Sutra, translated by Swami Gambhirananda. I remember once we were studying the Brahma Sutras with the help of the English translation of Swami Gambhirananda, a group of monks. And after I was reading, after some time one of the senior monks said, wonderful, so profound and so learned. I said, who? Shankara? He said, no, Gambhirananda, <laughs> the translator. <laughs> Yeah, so they are very precise. I remember once in the Himalayas, I m myself met a very scholarly traditional monk who lived in the mountains there. And when he knew that I went from, I'm from the Ramakrishna order, he said to me, uh, you have a Swami, Gambhirananda, his books are very accurate. I said, yeah, well, he was there for long, a long time ago. Aapka jo Gambhirananda hai na, wo unka kitab theek theek hai. Your, the, the Gambhirananda in your uh, order, his books are accurate. He was the 11th president of the order. My guru, Swami Bhuteshanandaji, was the 12th president. Swami, and they had a wonderful relationship. Bhuteshanandaji was, just as Gambhirananji was aloof and strict and awesome, Bhuteshanandaji was equally you know, at home with everybody and loving and like a person all the time melting in love and accessible to everybody. It's, it's strange. Even I've seen 
women calling him mother. Ma. People call him father, guru, mother. So like that. And the Swamis, we all loved him. We were like all over him all the time. He was, and this, imagine the great difference. He is 98. And we, are, we were youngsters at that time in our 20s. Huge, multi-generation difference. And yet we felt he could, he could be at one with everybody. Older people, younger people, and so on and so forth. Now the two of them had an interesting relationship. Swami Gambhirananda, who was his senior, and Swami Bhuteshananda. So Swami Gambhirananda would say, if there is somebody to be scolded, send him to me. And if somebody has to be persuaded with love, send him to Bhuteshananda. <laughs> he would say. He was fiercely independent. As a president, they are very old, 80s, 90s. So we have younger monks in attendance with them. Swami Gambhiran, they would not, uh, did not like it. He would be like the fierce independence of a wandering monk. Now he had lost almost entirety of his eyesight towards the end of his life. He would go out for these walks on the bank of the Ganga and he wouldn't want his attendant with him. One day, his attendant said, that we found that he had come back from the walk and he uncharacteristically he went to his room and he lay down. Remember, he's the president of the order and he was in his late 80s at that time. He went to his room and lay down. And so we went into the room and we saw something suspicious. The uh, sandals were muddy and the clothes were muddy a little bit. And he seemed to be, there was a, like a red uh, rash here. And when they examined him, he had dislocated his collarbone. Because he, was, he couldn't see clearly, he fell into the river. Um, from the, from the, tumbled into the river from the uh, it's lo, lo, high embankment. It was a mercy he was not killed. And he struggled out of this, this man in the late 80s, cleaned himself as best as he could so that others wouldn't suspect and he quietly came back and lay down in the room without telling anybody. Well, that was the last time he went out without an attendant. <laughs> so after that he was always surrounded by attendants. And one of his attendants was my teacher in the um, um, monastery. So he would tell me stories of Swami Gambhirananda. Swami Gambhirananda would always be either meditating or studying. Okay, here's another story of Swami Gambhirananda. Uh, this was told to me, to us, to a group of monks, by one of our heads, Swami Shivamayananda, who is now the vice president of the order. He was the head of an ashram where I was a novice. When he left that ashram to go to the main monastery, he called all the monks together and he gave a little talk. There was customary before the senior monk lives, leaves the place to another place. He gives some advice to the new monks. So he told us, do you know your monks and all these people come and respect you? Do you know why? What they expect of you? Hear what, what is, listen to me, what is expected of a monk. And then he told this story. Many, many years ago when Swami Gambhirananda was not yet the president of the order, he was the general secretary of the order. The Swami Shivamayananda, who told us the story, he said, we heard that he had disclosed to somebody that he had a vision of God, God realization, a vision of God. And I, the Swami telling us, said, I had my doubts about this because he was so reticent. It's, it's doubtful whether he would ever say such a thing. Anyhow, I was excited, so I wanted to ask him. So I went to him and I said, Swami, I heard you said this. Is this true? What have you experienced? And Gamiranji, of course, brushed him off. He said, no, no, what is this? What nonsense? Let me go. And then Shivamanji would not let go. He's also very interesting. <laughs> he wouldn't let go. He stood blocking his way. He said, I won't let you go. You have to tell me. Have you seen God? And then Gamiranji said, and these are the words, what do you mean by God realization? Whenever I close my eyes, those who are initiated, you will understand this. Whenever I close my eyes, the living form of my Ishta Devata blazes forth. The living form of God, the way I worship God, that blazes forth in my heart. Living form, not an imagination. It blazes forth in my heart. Whenever I close my eyes, he says. And then he says, but is this all? You, one has to realize Brahman, the divinity in all beings. In Bengali, he said, I'll tell you the original Bengali. Jokhoni chok bando kori, ridaite, ishto devata jivanto, jivanto ishto devata roop jal jal kore ote. Um, tabe eiki shab, shagva bhute brahma darshan kutte havena. You have to realize Brahman in all beings. And then he walked out quickly. 
And then this Swami turned to us and he said, that is what people expect from a monk. That this is, that's the level at which your consciousness should be, that your awareness should be tune, in tune with divinity all the time. So that was Swami Gambirananda. All these books, his attendant told me once, a very senior judge who was also interested in scriptures had come to meet Swami Gambhirananda. He came to the main monastery. I would like to talk to this very scholarly monk because I have some questions about the books he has translated. And when this was told to Swami Gambhirananda, he came out looking a little flustered. He said, ah, those books, I just wrote them to pass time. You know, but I, I don't know why he, he thinks he should consult me. <laughs> He wrote them to pass time and they have become the foundation of our scriptural study. <laughs> yes. But these are not available in good English translations. It's only um, in the last 100, 200 years that we are getting these translations. Other languages, English or even other languages, it was not available, it was, not, it was frowned upon to translate from Sanskrit. Even I have seen, we are studying Ashtavakra in, uh, in the Himalayas with a group of traditional monks. I had the Ramakrishna Mission public, uh, the publication edition, which is here. It's in Sanskrit and English. So I was studying it. Others had their books. They were in uh, Sanskrit or Hindi. And they were studying. And then when they saw mine, they, the monks were so curious. And they were saying, show us, show us. It's in English. And they passed it around among themselves. Look, look, it's in English. You have Vedanta in English these days. <laughs> yeah, he said, Dikhao, dikhao. Are wah, Angreji mein hai. Dekho, dekho, Angreji mein <laughs> Number nine, <coughs> concluding this whole thing that consciousness, the five aspects, not born, not dying, or not merging with Brahman, not affected by the impurities of the individual, body-mind, not having any specific qualities of the body-mind, they are not affected by that. And no relationship with the Absolute, it is the Absolute. These aspects now are concluded in the very nice ninth verse. Marane sambhave chaiva, Marane sambhave chaiva, Gatyagamana yorapi, Gatyagamana yorapi, Stito sarva shari resho, Stito sarva shari resho, Akashe na vilakshanaha. Akashena vilakshanaha. In all beings, just like in the pot, the space is there and um, it is not affected by the creation of this pot, by the shape of the pot, by the contents of the pot, by the destruction of the pot, not affected at all. Similarly, this one consciousness which gets associated with so many bodies and minds. It is not affected. Gati agamana yorapi. Gati agamana yorapi. Marane sambhavecha. It's not affected by the birth of the body. Though we feel it's such a great event. Born. Child is born. From the point of view of consciousness, nothing. Don't worry, you can still continue to celebrate birthday. <laughs> no problem there. But remember, you are not born with the birth of the body, nor do you die with the death of the body. Marane chaiva. No effect. Body goes. You are not affected by it. Gatyagamana Yorapi. Coming and going into this world, into other worlds, being born, heaven, hell, different kinds of bodies. This is, come, this is called transmigration. This is a grand idea in Indian thought. All schools of Indian thought, except the materialist. All of them, Nyaya, Vaisheshika, Sankhya, Yoga, Vedanta, dualist, non-dualist, Buddhist, Jaina, all of them, Sikh, all of them, they accept Coming and going. That means this cycle of birth and rebirth. But what Advaita adds to it is, the in central insight is, let it happen. Let it be real. Let it be false. Let it be whatever it is. You are not affected by it. You don't come with the coming of the body. You don't go with the going of the body. You are the one consciousness in which all of this is happening or appearing to happen. Akashena vilakshanaha. Just like no difference from the case of this sky and the pot. Akashena, Abhilakshana. Abhilakshana, not different. This is not a different case compared to the sky and pot example. Alright, this is done. Now one big issue remains. Going back to it. 
you said that or the or the mandukya says that the part space is not born from the great space the individual is actually not born of the um, absolute or material so the absolute is not a cause cause and effect are here god is said to be a cause of the world and the jeevas but the absolute is not is not a cause of any of this these are all appearances they are all appear and they all appear because of the absolute you are existence consciousness bliss because of your existence things appear to exist because of your consciousness all these conscious experiences are possible because you are bliss all meaning satisfaction joy in life is possible but you are not affected by any of them you are not limited by any of them you are the stage upon which this grand play of the universe is staged so you are not affected um remember whenever i give examples like film stage you have to understand it in context but so it's not a cause if it actually produced an individual then it would become a creator like god it's not a cause but now isn't it that you are saying just like a pot after all a pot was created true the pot space was not created not affected but the pot was created and it got affected and it got broken similarly if bodies and minds are created you are obviously implying bodies and minds are created after all where have they come from if bodies and minds are created from the absolute then the absolute becomes a cause after all the body mind is an effect the absolute is a cause and then where is non duality because there is the absolute non dual reality but then bodies and minds are many so that is the, then duality comes in so that is the question you understand the question i understand consciousness is one and the same but what about the minds and bodies where did they come from and if they have come then the consciousness becomes an effect or, or a cause and it becomes dualistic not non dual because now there are bodies minds and presumably the external world all right what is the answer no here you use the dream example dream example in your dream you being the same one dreamer suddenly a world appears the world of your dream there are people places things happening other people are there in your dreams you yourself you have a body in your dream and you have a personality in your dream and you do things in your dream there is happiness and misery and desire and frustration and envy and joy and all of that and events and space and time all of that is there in the dream so have you produced them are there real people there do you have to you know, the example i gave that uh, you ate a cookie before going to bed and you liked it and so in your dream you ate two more cookies so in the morning will you say i have i've gone over my sugar quota i had three cookies you will not say you will not count the two cookies you had in your dream you will not count them they are not to be counted as one two and three how many cookies did i have one similarly in consciousness when this entire universe it appears why does it appear because of maya so when it appears then it is not to be counted as a second thing or a third thing apart from consciousness so consciousness remains non dual because these are appearances consciousness remains non causal it's not a real cause producing a real effect it only appears to just as you appear to produce a universe in your mind keep the dream example in mind you will understand what's going to happen next let me read the verse sanghata swapna sanghata swapnavat sarve sanghata swapnavat sarve atma maya visarjitah atma maya visarjitah adhikye sarva samyeva आधिके सर्व साम्येवा नोपपत्तिर हि विद्यते नोपपत्तिर हि विद्यते संघाता द कॉन्ग्लोमरेट्स द द बॉडी माइंड कॉम्प्लेक्सेस संघाता मींस कॉम्प्लेक्स द बॉडी माइंड कॉम्प्लेक्सेस व्हाट अबाउट देम दे आर स्वप्नवत लाइक ड्रीम्स लाइक बॉडीज एंड माइंड्स एक्सपीरियंस्ड इन ड्रीम सर्वे ऑल ऑफ देम where do they come from in dream i understand the mind projects them but where do they come here in this world atma maya by the maya of brahman by the power of brahman 
which can project the one as the many does not make the one into the many. Because it's consciousness, all of this can appear in consciousness. Just like I have seen, I've, in fact, just like this now. Here is, in fact, um, if you look back in the window, you will see me and yourself and, and the picture of the Holy Mother. It's most distinct is the picture of the Holy Mother. Can you see? What's there in the window? Nothing, just dark space outside. Yet you can see the entire room there. It's an illusion created by this and the darkness there and the light and illusion. But it's symbolic that the Holy Mother is the one who is clearly visible there because she is Mahamaya. <laughs> According to Vedanta, it's the, it's the mother's projection. This entire universe is a play. Here is an optical illusion. There is something here which is reflected there. But in the case of consciousness, you don't need something else to be reflected in consciousness. Consciousness has this unique power of experiencing diversity within itself without becoming diverse. Experiencing duality within itself without becoming dual. Just as the one cookie does not become three because you imagine two more in your dream. The one non-dual reality which you are, you don't become multiple because you imagine a universe within yourself. So the power to do this is Maya. It's called Maya. It's one of the most difficult subjects in Vedanta, Maya. How does the one appear to be the many? How did the one become the many? The answer in Vedanta is one did not become the many. Then the one appears as the many. Even then you might ask, how does the one appear as the many? The answer is Maya. Some, now you may ask, so this Maya, is it a second thing apart from Brahman? Then there will be duality. Brahman by itself is pure consciousness or Atman by itself is pure consciousness. But its ability to appear as something else, that Maya, if it is real, then it's a second real thing. There will be two then, Atman and Maya. But no. The maya of Atman is called Anirvachanya. It cannot be expressed as being an independent reality, but it cannot be said to be non-existent also. So that maya which is neither a separate reality nor, an, uh, nor unreal, the effects of that maya are also Anirvachanya, this world. You cannot say it's a separate reality apart from the absolute, but you cannot say it's not there either because you experience it. Because it does not exist apart from the absolute, we can't say it's an independent reality. It's real, you cannot say. But because you experience it, you cannot deny it. You, can, you can't say it doesn't exist at all. This, this inability to determine its nature, this fundamental indeterminability of, of the universe is called the falsity of the universe, mithyatva. This relative nature, the, this uh, indeterminate nature, uh, the... Um, this incomplete nature of this universe, inexplicable nature of the universe, this is called Maya. From the Advaita point of view, all that is important is Maya is not a separate reality from Atman, so there is no problem. It does not bring Atman into the world of causality, duality or change. Change in Maya is not a change in Atman. Product of Maya is not a product of Atman. And the existence of Maya is not duality in the Atman. So Atman remains as beyond causality, beyond change and non-dual. That's all that you're uh, interested in. You had a question? No. Yeah. You had a question? Yes. That's okay. Okay. <laughs> so this is the answer. About the part and space, uh, one thing you should know. In the Vedantic cosmology, even the part is produced by the space. How? How can part... I can imagine the pot space being, a, being in non-different from the great space. But the pot itself, what is it? What is the pot itself? Uh, in the example also in Vedanta, um, you have to remember the old Vedantic cosmology or Indian cosmology. In fact, all ancient cultures. Space, air, fire, water, earth. Yes. Taittiriya Upanishad says, Tasmad va e tasmad atmana. In fact, it says before that, Satyam Jnanam Anantam Brahma. Brahman, the Absolute, is infinite existence and consciousness. Then next, after a couple of sentences, it says, the Taittiri Upanishad, Tasmad Va E Tasmad Atmanaha. From that Brahman, which is the Absolute, infinite consciousness and bliss, uh, existence and consciousness, from that Absolute, which is this Atman, so that Absolute is this Atman, yourself, 
Akash Asambhuta, space appeared. How did space appear from, from the self? It is by Maya. Akashad Vayu, from space comes air. Vayor Agni, from air comes fire. Uh, Agner Apaha, from fire comes water. What do these fire, earth, space, what they mean? Um, this is a matter of investigation now. For a long time, that's how people took it. But now we have an entirely different worldview given by physics, modern physics. So should we at all try to relate these two? Some people think so. A great scientist, John Dobson, who is the inventor of the Dobson telescope, actually. He was in California. I never met him, but I've read his papers. He was a disciple of Swami Ashokananda. And one job which Swami Ashoka... Did you meet John Dobson? No. Anybody here? No. Um, Swami Ashokananda, one mission he gave him was to map the ancient Vedantic cosmology, actually it is Sankhyan cosmology, with modern physics. So he wrote papers on what do you mean by sky, by space, by air or by fire, and how do you relate it to the modern physics of space, time, vibration, radiation, things like that. Anyway, from fire comes water, um, Adbhya Prithivi, from water comes the earth, and so on, it goes on. But our interest is in the earth. Because the pot is made of earth. And what is earth made of? It, when in that sequence you go back to the Atma itself. Earth is nothing other than water, is nothing other than fire, is nothing other than air, nothing other than space, which is an appearance of the Atman. So even the pot, the, its cause, if you stop at space, space is the cause of the pot. Space appears itself as pot. And it seems, to, it seems to demarcate itself and create a pot space. Similarly, the Atman itself appears as this universe, as the body minds, and appears to demarcate itself as individual selves. The individual self is none other than the Atman. This universe itself is none other than the Atman. These bodies and minds are also none other than the Atman. They are appearances in Atman. By what? By Maya. Just as the world appears in you, by what? By the power of dreaming, similarly. So that concludes a big section, an important section. We started off by trying to demonstrate the non-duality of the Atman with the help of reasoning and examples, experience examples. Now, because it is Vedanta, it is supposed to be based on the Upanishads. So what Gaudapada will now do is, in the next several verses, he will call upon the Upanishads to show that what he is saying here is not his invention. The Upanishads themselves talk about all this. So uh, it will be interesting in two ways. One is it gives us a quick survey of the essential teachings of different Upanishads. He will do that. The second thing is note that he expects us to know. He will just refer to something here, something there. He expects us to have read all the Upanishads. That's why the Mandukya is said to be the last. So he expects us to immediately understand. But luckily we have Shankaracharya to point out that this quotation is from the Taittiriya. That, uh, this, and Gaudapada himself says this is from Taittiriya. But he will point out which is from which Upanishad. Instead of taking it as a series of dry quotations, we can actually use this occasion, which we will do from next time onwards, to take a quick lightning tour, uh, a crash course in the Upanishads, guided by none other than Gaudapada. Just see the highlights. You know, like a tourist visiting one day in each country. <laughs> so these are all vast texts, but we just want to see the highlights in each each one. So we will see that for next time onwards. Yes. Swamiji, so by what you said, inert objects are also Atman. In fact, inert. The more correct way of putting it is, inert objects are not Atman alone. Is. Remember Mary Hale's poem, who she wrote to Swami Vivekananda. Uh, I understand what you have taught. All is God. And Swami Vivekananda wrote back saying, I have never taught such strange doctrine that all is God. She said, you have. I am quoting you. And he said, no, I have not taught that all is God. I have taught all God alone is. All is not. In fact, oh, I forgot to translate one thing. Good that you, you reminded me. Second line. Adikya sarva sammeva no vidyate. In all the manifestations, 
excellence or greatness or misery or or minuteness the good and the bad the great and the glory and the miserable and the horrible none of this is logical in this world why because they don't exist what exists is atman so shall we say that then everything is the same not everything is the same everything is not the atman is the same that's why he says um, adikya excellence all right excellence something is better than other i am better than everybody else that's not true fine then we are all the same that's also not true this idea of we all this must be abandoned it's not that we are all the moment we all comes the differences also will come but these differences along with the idea of we all neither difference nor sameness is correct no upapatti what is correct is that one reality alone exists i remember this monk very intelligent monk i told you this earlier so he says i'm going to write this book in which the character is an as in a novel in which this character is a hero is the is enlightened so monk hero is always enlightened the character is enlightened and he behaves less like an ordinary person with everybody but inside he has like total contempt for everybody i said just a minute that does not sound very enlightened at all you see what has happened is a strong self the individuality and what we do is we keep trying to improve this individuality and improve it to such an extent that it is towering above everybody else ah now i am enlightened no you are not you have only inflated the ego to a terrible extent <laughs> that is just the opposite of enlightenment the enlightened person will feel i am one with everybody or that one alone exists see these are the attitudes of a spiritual being that uh, an enlightened person all this is maya this is a spiritual attitude i alone am all of this this is also spiritual attitude god alone is all of this that's a spiritual attitude but all this is brahman the absolute that's also spiritual attitude but i am separate and this world is there good and bad i am trying to struggle and make a position for myself in this world this is the attitude of the unenlightened person the swami who said this sab maya hai this is spiritual sab swaroop hai everything is my own nature i am everything that's also spiritual sab ishwar hai everything is god that's the devotee's attitude that's also spiritual or brahman alone is the reality the world is an appearance that's also spiritual take any of them but the unenlightened person's attitude is not like that it's it's an attitude of duality and division and separation and high and low and struggle and strife that's the attitude of the enlightened person yes what was the verse which is finished uh, swamiji uh, the swamiji but was it 11 or 10 or 11 what was the ten, verse number number what i just finished was 10th yes 10th okay. that's what i said yes 10th from the 11th onwards godapada will take us on a lightning tour of the upanishads yes Yes, there's supposed to be a rishi, but the, it's difficult to say. There are different stories about how the Mandukya, uh, Manduka means a frog. <laughs> so how does it come? Uh, so they always invent a rishi <laughs> that, that a great sage was there of the name from whose name this uh, Upanishad has come. But that seems to be a bit of a back calculation, back tracking, because the name is there, so there must have been a rishi like this. We really don't know. but the story goes that there was a rishi of that name and how many upanishads 18 or 30 upanishads how many upanishads if you see look at the book gamiranji eight upanishads the, these are the eight smaller ones there are two bigger ones so they complete the 10 upanishads which shankaracharya took as the foundation of vedanta isha kena katha prashna munda mandukya titirihi ऐतरेयम च छांदोग्यम बृहद आरण्यकम तथा द टेन उपनिषद्स इट्स अ नाइस वर्स टू मेमोराइज द टेन उपनिषद्स दिस व्हेन यू स्टार्ट लर्निंग वेदांत यू मेड मेड टू मेमोराइज दिस दीस आर द टेन फंडामेंटल उपनिषद्स व्हाट आर दे ईशा उपनिषद केन उपनिषद कठो उपनिषद प्रश्न उपनिषद 
then um, Taiteri Upanishad, Aiteri Upanishad, um, Mundak Upanishad, Mandukya Upanishad, um, um, Chandogya Upanishad, Brihadaranik Upanishad. Was that 10? I think so. So these are 10 and non-controversially Shankaracharya has written co commentaries on these 10 and they form the foundation, the textual foundation of Advaita Vedanta. If you want to know what is the root text, source text, these 10 Upanishads. There is one more, the Shvetashvatar Upanishad, on which Shankaracharya has written a commentary, but that scholars have some doubt whether it is written by the original Shankaracharya or later on. The quality of the commentary is also a little indifferent to compared to these first 10. And, but, so are there 11 Upanishads? There are more than that. Um, we find a list of, in the Muktika Upanishad itself, Hanuman asks Ramachandra, Sri Rama, how will I get liberation, moksha, freedom? And Ramachandra tells Hanuman, Mandukyam ekam eva alam mumukshunam vimuktaye. The Mandukya Upanishad by itself is enough to give liberation to those who desire liberation. So we are lucky. We are doing the one text which is enough, recommended by none other than Sri Rama himself, the avatar of Vishnu. That that itself is enough to give liberation to those who want liberation, freedom, enlightenment. That one text. And it is the smallest one. But then he says, suppose I don't get liberation. We are almost at the third chapter and I have not been enlightened yet. And I, I don't see much chance of getting enlightened by the fourth chapter. Uh, then, then Sri Ramachandra gives a list of 108 Upanishads. 108, he gives the names, including these 11 Upanishads. So, just because Shankaracharya chose these 10 Upanishads, arguably 11, these are called the major Upanishads. And the rest are called minor Upanishads. But major and minor only because Shankara made this difference. Um, but they all teach the same thing. Yeah. So better get enlightenment with this one Upanishad. <laughs> Otherwise, 108 await you. Keno, Keno, what's the name of this one? Keno Upanishad? Yes, we will read it in, term, in time, once you finish this one. Isha, Kena, Katha, Prashna. Isha Upanishad, Kena Upanishad, Katha Upanishad, Prashna Upanishad, Mundaka Upanishad, Mandukya. Aitariya, Taitariya, Chandogya, Vidarnak. Ken Upanishad is one of them. You are asking too many questions. You, <laughs> you have run out of your... So, uh, each Upanishad tells about a glimpse of the Brahman. Not the same thing, different thing. One each Upanishad tells you the same truth that you are Brahman, but in different ways. The approach is different. That makes Vedanta so rich. You have such a multiplicity, huge array of approaches. The Mandukates is unique because its approach is the three states, waking, dreaming, deep sleep. That's unique to the Mandukya. Of course, it's found in Brihadaranyaka also. Uh, Atman is, is, has no beginning, no end, yes. etc. Does the appearance of Atman, which is the universe, have a beginning or an end? No, beginningless, endless. Beginningless, end is there. It's called Anadi. Um, uh, Oh, Santa. That means beginningless but with an end. End means what? When you realize the Atman, then you realize that the appearance is nothing but the Atman itself. So the, the illusion, the samsara, that has an end. Does it have There's a no beginning? Big bang. There's no big bang to start it out with. They, they can be, uh, be, I mean, we don't know, they don't talk about big bang, but <laughs> they talk about multiple universes. So, the, if there is going to be a big bang, there are going to be multiple big bangs. And that's also not very much against modern physics. And, uh, one theory says there is a, this universe which expands and collapses again. But that's a little out of fashion. But many theories have come and go out of fashion. The uh, Vedantic, the Hindu idea is, is a cyclical. The cosmos goes through cycles. Creation, existence, then disappearance again. Again, creation, existence, disappearance. What Advaita says is, this whole thing is an appearance, it's not real. What is real is the background Atman. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupa Namastu